The world is divided into four spheres, each sphere divided among continents and nations. Nations are divided by borders and interests. These interests divide the news. We examine the impact of these divisions on people and power. This is Imaginary Lines. Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Michael Fox. During the South American military dictatorships of the 1970s and 1980s, tens of thousands of individuals were kidnapped, tortured, killed, and disappeared. Each year in late May, their relatives remember their loss during the International Week of the Disappeared. I'll speak with John Dingus, the author of the book The Condor Years, and a former correspondent in Chile in the 1970s about the tactic of repression and disappearance in South America and its legacy today. But first, a look at media in Latin America. On May 17th, Mexico's Progreso magazine published a report by journalist J. Jesus Esquivel claiming that the Colombian FARC guerrillas had been providing combat training to members of Mexican drug cartels. The report was quickly picked up and repeated by various media outlets. Esquivel, who has written extensively about drug trafficking in Mexico, cites anonymous sources from unnamed U.S. intelligence agencies to back the claim. According to the writer, the intelligence services have discovered the alleged training, but have failed to provide concrete figures on the number of those participating in the activities. The timing of this supposed revelation is suspect. The Mexican government suffered a heavy blow when members of the Jalisco New Generation cartel downed a military helicopter earlier this month, killing six soldiers. Esquivel argues that this is proof of the cartel's increased capacity to inflict casualties on the Mexican armed forces as a result of their training at the hands of the FARC. But attempts to link this incident with the Colombian guerrillas has the appearance of a smear campaign. The current Colombian peace process has gone further than any other recent effort at ending the decades-long conflict. Both parties have taken important steps to help consolidate the negotiations. Just this month, arrest orders against FARC leader Timochenko were suspended by the Colombian government so that he could travel to Havana to aid the negotiations. But peace has its enemies, particularly those who profit from war, as Pope Francis recently affirmed. Some of these opponents of peace have friends in U.S. intelligence agencies. Reported leaks from anonymous sources in unnamed intelligence sectors should always be treated with caution. The U.S. government may publicly support the peace process, but there are many in Washington, Colombia, and elsewhere who have it in their interests to see the conflict continue. The International Week of the Disappeared is commemorated each year at the end of May. The week was founded in 1981 by the Latin American Federation of Associations for Relatives of Disappeared Detainees. During the mid to late 1970s, the military dictatorships of the region collaborated to crack down on dissidents in an elaborate network known as Operation Condor. Together they tortured, killed, and disappeared thousands. John Dingus is the author of the book The Condor Years, how Pinochet and his allies brought terrorism to three continents. He's a former correspondent in Chile and has been tenured faculty at the Columbian University Graduate School of Journalism since 1996. John Dingus, welcome to Imaginary Lines. Well, good to be here. John, explain for our audience what forced disappearances are in the context of Latin America. When I was in Chile in 1972 to 73, I was there for the coup. Uh, and then for a year after, uh, we there were a lot of there was a lot of repression at the beginning. The bodies were appearing in the streets. In 1974, we thought it was getting better. Uh, bodies weren't appearing anymore. Uh, there was still a lot of repression, but people were kind of optimistic that the worst was over. Well, that was not true. The government reorganized, created a secret police called DINA, and they began a very secret campaign of repression combined with terrorism. Uh, the repression was never acknowledged by the government. None of the detentions of the uh, hundreds of people were ever acknowledged. Uh, people would simply disappear from the streets. And for a while, we thought that that meant that they were, okay, they were in a secret prison someplace. Um, they're going to appear after a couple weeks, a couple months. Well, a friend of mine, uh, Alejandro Avalos, uh, disappeared in that way, and we really thought he was going to appear. Uh, as time went on, and, and I started contacting the 
talking to the people at the uh, Comité uh, Pro Pass, this is 1975, uh, I became aware that there was something else going on. I didn't even have a word for it. The word disappeared did not exist in anybody's vocabulary. We kind of wondered whether it was missing. Um, and um, But I started keeping track month by month how many people were disappeared. And I started interviewing people who had been released from the prisons or people who had gotten in to visit people in the prisons and they were able to talk to people who had seen people in the very secret prisons like Via Grimaldi and gradually pieced together this terrible, terrible story of people being tortured to the point of death uh, and, and those people seen by other people but then eventually never seen again, disappearing even from the prisons, and those are the people who never appeared again. And approximately 1,200 of them uh, were in that situation. It was a, a um, the word in Spanish is escalofriante, it's bone chilling, the, the, the realization that the government is doing this kind of a tactic. That's the tactic of forced disappearances. What was the goal? Why were these regimes using this terror tactic? On the one hand, it was pure repression uh, to basically show that anybody that raised their hand, their their head uh, against the military dictatorship, would be cut down in the worst possible way. And secondly, it was a terror message, terror in the classical sense of propaganda. Uh, it was uh, something that everybody understood but which was completely hidden from any of the official media. And so it was magnified in its importance and its impact because people never knew the extent of it. They just had this fear that anything could happen. It had a tremendous impact in, in dampening down the ability of people to, to organize. It, it was an atmosphere of tremendous fear among ordinary people some of whom were political act, polit politically active, uh, many of whom were not, but maybe were working with churches or working with human rights. John, you wrote in your book, The Condor Years, that during the inaugural months of CIA training in Chile in 1974, that the number of disappeared multiplied. Why is that? Uh, uh, there's no evidence that the CIA was training Dina in disappearances. Uh, there is evidence that they were training them in intelligence, in intelligence exchange and in coordination with other countries. Uh, that's what we know about it. Uh, the idea that the, um, that the CIA was training them specifically in torture and specifically in the tactic of disappearance, um, a lot of people believe that, but there's, there's not really a lot of evidence for that. Uh, the, the role of the CIA, the role of the U.S. government at this time, was essentially to give a green light to pretty much whatever tactic the Chileans came up with. Uh, not necessarily endorsing the individual tactics, but certainly not disapproving them either. Uh, so the, the U.S. has really for a long time never acknowledged that any of that training took place. We've never seen the details of it declassified. Um, Manuel Contreras himself, the head of the secret police, Dina, was the one who first revealed that it was that the CIA was training his uh, his organization later on in a official U.S. report named called the Hinchy Report. The U.S. finally acknowledged that they had been training uh, the secret police. Beyond Chile, what was the U.S. role in promoting and encouraging the policies of repression and disappearances as a legitimate means to deal with subversives in the enemy? Well, I don't think the emphasis should be on the U.S. at this point. The, the U.S. role was in defending uh, inter the, the military governments internationally. Uh, and, uh, and when there were human rights violations, uh, the U.S., uh, I called it a red light, green light policy, publicly the U.S. was saying, oh, no, no, we don't agree with these human rights violations. Privately in private uh, meetings, the U.S. was basically saying, we understand that you've got a tough job to do. You've, you're fighting terrorists. And, uh, you know, get it over as soon as possible. And, oh, by the way, maybe uh, release a few token prisons, prisoners so that people, so that we can say that you're improving human rights. 
John, thank you so much for joining me on Imaginary Lines. Well, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Last month's tragic drowning of 900 people in the Mediterranean awoke the world to the plight of African migrants who risk everything, including their lives, to escape the violence, persecution, and poverty of their homelands. Yet barely a few weeks since the incident, most of the world has already forgotten. And where there was once sympathy for the migrants and their situation, there is now a move to militarize the response to the crisis. Instead of addressing the structural causes of migrations, such as the foreign intervention that has wreaked havoc on the African continent, leaders from the European Union have opted to try to capture smugglers involved in the movement of people. Specifically, the EU wants to target boats off the coast of Libya, the very country bombed by Western nations in 2011 in an effort to oust Muammar Gaddafi. This military effort will invariably result in innocent deaths, a fact that even EU leaders admit. NATO Secretary General Jean Stoltenberg publicly alleged that Islamic State militants might be trying to, quote, blend in among the migrants. It also seems that policymakers are deliberately confusing the difference between people smuggling and people trafficking. According to a recent piece in The Guardian by Nottingham professor Julia O'Connell Davison, smuggling involves two consenting parties, and trafficking is the movement of people through force, coercion, or deception. EU leaders are painting themselves as champions of justice in the face of a modern-day slave trade. Yet nothing could be further from the truth. It is clear that migrants are heading to Europe precisely because of the actions of groups like NATO in Africa. That's it for today's program. Thanks for watching the show. I'm your host, Michael Fox. Please join me next week.